test testing audio. Testing. Okay. Um, if you can hear me right now and the audio and video is good, could you please leave a comment? Now we're planning to start at 6.30. Yeah, so we're just gonna give it a little bit of time to wait for people to either uh, filter in uh, or just to make sure that everything is working on the video side. Uh, once again, hello if you're watching this live. Uh, if you can hear everything and see everything, that's fine. Please leave me, uh, please send something in the chat so I can just make sure that everything is doing okay. Uh, if not, let me know what's going wrong. You might not be able to hear this, so that might be what's going wrong. Um, if you're watching the recorded version of this, welcome. Hopefully this is also working and the audio is doing fine. Uh, but we'll be starting short. Uh, shortly to talk about the Security Council. Great, okay, thank you. I got some comments. Okay, so we're gonna wait a little bit longer. Um, I'm gonna start in a few minutes just to let whoever wants to come and watch this live uh, to be able to see this live. So just hang tight for another minute or two. Okay, uh, got more people saying that the audio is fine. Perfect, okay. Um, so Hassan, I think you can view previous sessions. They'll be uploaded online. Um, I'm not 100% sure if they're being uploaded right after the video has been recorded or until the entire series of videos has been recorded. Uh, but you can definitely email us at info at h1india.org uh, to get more information about that. Okay, great. We're going to be starting very, very soon. 
Um, so I'm just going to do one last audio check. If you need the volume to be higher or lower, let me know. Or if everything is good, just let me know in the chat. Okay, um, so great, let's get started. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone who's watching this live. Uh, today we're gonna be talking about um, the introduction to the Security Council uh, for Harvard Model United Nations India 2017. The conference is happening just a month away. And so this seminar is meant to help educate you if you're in the Security Council, the Historical Security Council, or just interested in uh, the Security Council, the most actionable organ of the United Nations. Um, so we're going to be talking about this over the course of the next hour. Um, I'm going to break this up into several major sections. Uh, and at any time, if you have any questions, please let me know in the chat. I want to be able to answer you immediately and give you immediate feedback on whatever uh, questions that you have. If you ever get confused or you need something re-explained, please let me know. This is supposed to be a dynamic uh, sort of presentation and I want to make sure that I'm going to cater it to all of your needs. Uh, if you're watching this uh, recorded, sorry, I won't be able to answer your comments, but if you do have any questions, particularly about the uh, Security Council or the Historical Security Council Committee, you can email me at hsc at hmanindia.org. And I should be able to answer any questions that you have about that. Um, so without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to quickly uh, introduce uh, myself. So my name is Andrew Jung. I'm going to be a rising junior or third year at uh, Harvard College. And I study, uh, I do a major in statistics, uh, statistics with a minor in economics. Uh, so much more uh, quant quantitative focused uh, that you might not see so much uh, in a model unit fashion but I really am passionate about international relations government and exploring like the historical relationships uh, that have existed over uh, over the course of the Cold War uh, on Harvard College I do a lot for the International Relations Council which does a majority of our uh, model UN activities and so um, I'm actually one of the co-head delegates for our intercollegiate model UN team. So we travel to other colleges conferences and do exactly what you guys will be doing in H1 India uh, a month away. Uh, and I also, uh, and I'm also crisis directing for two committees uh, this uh, coming January uh, and February, one committee for our high school conference H1 in Boston and another for our college conference HN month. Um, this past year, so this past January, I ran the Historical Security Council at H. Munn, Boston. Uh, that is going to be very similar to the Historical Security Council that I'm running um, in one month from now, H. Munn, India, uh, doing one of the topics that we covered back then. And so I've been doing the Histor Historical Security Council uh, for uh, a lot of my Model UN career, and so I feel very passionate about uh, this committee, and so, uh, yeah, that's my quick introduction. If you have any questions about that, we can talk about that um, near the end, but I don't want to get keep you guys waiting. We can go straight into uh, talking about the history 
the United Nations. So there's several, there's four major sections I, I want to break this uh, sort of seminar into. The first, I'm going to talk about the history of the United Nations, why it was created, why it's so necessary, and uh, how it has evolved since its creation to uh, what it exists today. Uh, secondly, I'm going to briefly talk about the powers of the United Nations. I'm going to um, mention a bit of these in the history of the United Nations part, but uh, it's also very important to recognize exactly what the Security Council uh, can do uh, and how it can work within the United Nations. Uh, thirdly, I'm going to talk about the format and the veto power. Um, and then finally, I'm going to talk about how uh, the Security Council and the Historical Security Council is going to be run at H1 India. Um, so uh, I will be running at the H uh, Historical Security Council. The director, John Bowers, will be running the Security Council. And we both have slightly differentiated ways that we want to run our committee that I'll be run, uh, running through uh, towards the end of this uh, seminar. Okay, great. Uh, so let's start on the history of the United Nations. Uh, once again, if you have any questions, please feel free to send them in the chat. I will be trying to address them as best as I can. Great. Okay, so the United Nations, uh, what, the Security Council within the United Nations is one of the most main organs and it's charged to maintain uh, international peace and security. Uh, that was the original goal that was created, but how did we get there? Um, so, after World War I, it ended in 1919, the world decided to meet at the Paris Peace Conference to create something that was called the League of Nations. Uh, this was the precursor for the United Nations that served as an international body that would try to either settle minor territorial disputes, start creating small international structures like post, um, and do a lot of the mini versions of what the modern day United Nations would create. The, the, the idea of the League of Nations was to create sort of this uh, peaceful body that would be able to settle world issues uh, at, a, at a time. Um, uh, just quick pause. Uh, Piano Guy asks, can you talk about directives and communiques as well? Uh, I'll definitely talk about that towards the end when uh, I'm discussing how each of the committees will be run. Um, okay, so to get back to it, the League of Nations was created right after World War I, uh, but there was a huge lack of representation within the League itself. About half of the world's population uh, were colonial people, and they were not represented within this body. Uh, furthermore, the United States, um, the Soviet Union at that point, um, Germany and Japan were all not part of the League of Nations. Each of these countries had their own reasons for it. For instance, in the United States, uh, the then President Woodrow Wilson felt that uh, was battling his own Congress about uh, the U.S.'s role within the international community following World War I. And it was ultimately decided that the United States nation wanted to retreat towards sort of a mini isolationism and away from international politics and away from being in the standstill of uh, these huge international structures. Other countries that, um, like the USSR, Germany, and Japan, were simply just not included uh, in the League of Nations. And so when you have a lot of these big nations not being represented and a huge part of the world population not being represented, it becomes less of an international institution and more of um, just a body of nations meeting. And so the League of Nations didn't, did not take any sort of action when Japan invaded Manchuria, when Italy and Ethiopia went to war, or when Japan occupied China, or when the Nazis started expanding. And these were all events within the 1930s that the League of Nations was essentially ineffective at addressing. And so by the time that World War II started, uh, the then US President uh, FDR or Roosevelt started, was starting to plan a new world organization. Um, in 1942, the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, the USSR, uh, and the People's Republic of China started signed a short document uh, that would later be known as the United Nations Declaration. 22 other nations signed this the day after. And what this sort of declared was uh, the, the former thinkings of uh, 
what would become the United Nations, this idea of an international institution that would be all-inclusive uh, and would do the things that the League of Nations was incapable of doing to um, the, the two decades before it existed. Um, and so in, in deciding this, it was these four nations, so the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, the Soviet Union, and China, that were all going to be the huge foundation for the executive branch that would become the Security Council. They all wanted actionable powers. Um, and so when it came to 1944, the delegates of these four major countries, or they're called Big Four, they met at Dumberton Oaks Conference uh, in Washington, D.C. in America to negotiate the structure of the U.N. The biggest issue at this point was the composition of the United Nations Security Council, um, especially uh, the choosing of its permanent members. Um, and so the U.S. Uh, there, there are several contentions over this. For instance, the United States tried to add Brazil to that list of um, permanent members, but other nations found this disfavorable and uh, would not agree on allowing Brazil. Uh, furthermore, veto rights were discussed there. That's, um, and there's disagreement over whether or not a nation would be, should be able to veto a resolution uh, at any point in time, or if they could only veto resolutions if they were not actually a part of the resolution. Uh, for instance, uh, if two countries had gone to war, we would, if the UK went to war against another country, we would not want it to have the veto power against a resolution condemning or taking actionable um, or taking action within that war. Uh, and so that was the question of how powerful should the veto power be um, and how powerful should we let these big nations that we give the veto power to, um, that how powerful should these nations be within this international institution. Um, so finally, in 1945, in the Yalta Conference, uh, that was at the beginning of the year in February, uh, the U United States, UK, and the USSR delegates all agreed that the Big Five, uh, so they actually decided to add France, so this became the Big Five, they, see that they decided that they should, they should have the power to veto all actions. Um, and so that was all actions that were, uh, all resolutions or all directives that the committee passed, uh, but it did not include procedural motions. So no nation could prevent debate about any certain topic only action that the Security Council should take. And so that was the ultimate conclusion um, that was decided at the Yalta Conference in terms of um, the powers of the Security Council. And so the United Nations is finally ratified later on that year in October, and they meet for the first time um, in the following year. And so right after World War II, we sort of delve into this decade of the beginning of the Cold War between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. And so the Council's the Security Council is really not able to do anything at the beginning of the Cold War. Um, because there's veto power from both the United States and the USSR, it's sort of a standstill, a stalemate between these two nations about what sort of things um, they're, they're going to allow get passed within the resolution. Um, the one exception to this was in 1950, the U.S. coalition, um, uh, sorry, the U.S. sent a U.N.-sponsored coalition to repel North Korean um, invaders during Cold War in the Korean War. And the only reason this was able to pass is because the Russian delegates were outside of the room at that point when they were moving into voting procedure. And so um, when it came to count votes, because the Soviet delegates were not present, it counted as an abstention. Um, and the U.S., the United States was actually able to push something that was directly countering, uh, that was directly countering uh, this Soviet interests. Um, so, quick question. So, Anjali asks, so only resolutions and amendments can be vetoed? Uh, yes. So, the Big Five has the veto power to veto anything that is of substance. So, I like to differentiate substantive um, substantive directives and uh, procedural, sorry, substantive motions and procedural motions. So procedural motion would be like a uh, motion to have a moderate caucus on this subject. That cannot be vetoed within the Security Council, but a motion to um, pass this resolution that allows for XYZ 
can be vetoed by any of the big five nations? Okay, uh, that was a good question, thank you. Uh, so to go back, so um, the Security Council was not really effective within this first decade. It wasn't until 1956 that we were able to send uh, the first peacekeeping force to end the Suez Crisis. Um, and throughout that next year, uh, sorry, the next decade, they had limited sort of presence in international conflicts. In 1960, the UN sent an operation into the Congo with a huge military force that was represented by the UN peacekeepers, um, and that was passed by the Security Council. But throughout that decade, the Council has really bypassed many larger global conflicts. For instance, the Cuban Missile Crisis in the Vietnam War, the Council was just, the Security Council was just incapable of debating this because of the veto power and because um, because these big nations had such a huge influence in these major conflicts. Um, instead, the Security Council settled for sending small forces to West New Guinea um, and had a mission to Cyprus, which is actually the longest running mission uh, to this day that uh, the UN has ever uh, created. Uh, coming into the 1970s, um, this, this decade was even worse for the Security Council's uh, involvement in international politics and it actually became so that the security council was starting to begin starting to become used for uh, social and economic development instead of general peacekeeping of the world um, instead like peacekeeping or in, or to better said war was decided between uh, the nations within the security council but not in the security council itself um, and so we come towards uh, the post-Cold War, where around from 1988 to the beginning of the new um, of the new century, we see a sort of resurgence in the Security Council's ability uh, to agree on things. And this is sort of due to the uh, end of the Cold War, or sort of the termination of this huge geopolitical conflict between the United States, the USSR, and its major allies. Um, so between that, uh, that last decade, we see a huge number of resolutions that's passed. We see the peacekeeping budget skyrocket. It's almost 10 times what it was before. And we see, uh, varying, uh, varying levels of successful missions. Um, when, for instance, the United, uh, the UN, the UNSC, the United Nations Security Council, is able to broker a treaty within the Salvadorian Civil War. Uh, which my committee is actually about, um, or they're able to send forces into Namibia or South Africa to settle apartheid um, in the Khmer Rouge uh, last stand in Cambodia, uh, or the Iraq invasion of Kuwait 1991. Uh, the beginning of the decade, however, saw many different ineffective uses of uh, the um, of the Security Council. For instance, in uh, there are three major missions that they're sent on in Somalia, Bosnia, and Rwanda. Uh, you might be most familiar with the Rwandan genocide and overall the United Nations ineffectiveness in uh, in calming the ethnic conflict between the Hutus and the Tutsis uh, during that entire civil war. And so, the United Nations, uh, and especially the Security Council, was particularly condemned for its inaction within this huge um, civil war that Rwanda was going under, um, and its uh, uh, like effective uh, or its ineffectiveness um, of its peacekeeping forces on the ground of that nation. Uh, in Somalia and Bosnia. Uh, there are similar events where indecision or just impracticality of uh, the Security Council and its and the actions that it's taken uh, led to huge global public condemnation of the organization. Um, so past that time, there are different other conflicts um, that the Security Council was involved in. For instance, the Sudan War in Darfur. Uh, there are various conflicts in uh, the Congo. Um, the, U the UNSC tried to get involved in the Sri Lankan Civil War, for which 
He was condemned once again for having uh, quote unquote systemic failure. Um, and in most, most recently, the Security Council has brokered this non-proliferation treaty that's negotiated for many of the sides within the Syrian conflict. Um, so that's the majority of, uh, the, at least the main points within the history of, um, of the development of the Security Council. Uh, if you have any questions about that part before we move on to the next, please let me know in the chat. Okay, um, great. So we're going to continue to the next section, uh, discussing the powers of the, of the uh, Security Council. So the Security Council, I like to break this down into four major uh, sections. So number one, Security Council can send uh, peacekeeping missions or peacekeeping operations. And so we discussed this a bit before during the history of its various different missions. Um, the first one, of course, to the Suez Crisis, and the most recent ones to sort of address uh, the conflict happening in the Middle East with the Syrian crisis. Um, and so that is the most public form in which the UN can send peacekeepers to regions where armed conflict has, um, has existed uh, over those times. Um, the U United Nations itself doesn't have its own military, and so uh, the peacekeeping forces are often supplied by member states themselves. Uh, and this is on a volunteer basis. And so there have definitely been criticisms of the United Nations and its bias within its military forces uh, based on the volunteer options that have been provided. So for instance, the United States in, in the modern age has is the, is the biggest supplier of the UN peacekeeping forces. And so there's criticism that, for instance, if the UN took a negative stance towards the United States action, that the peacekeeping forces would not be able to do anything against its own country. Um, and so there's definitely a problem in this sort of stratified volunteer basis um, that the Security Council uh, actions for the UN's own military, uh, sorry, for the UN's own peacekeeping forces. Uh, so the peacekeepers are often called blue helmets because well, they wear blue helmets and it's very distinctive. Um, and so UN peacekeeping have been fall, uh, have been uh, have been sent in many different missions uh, all across the world that have been trying to uh, that have overall been trying to maintain the peace uh, within whatever region they're being sent. Um, so the second second power that uh, the second major power the Security Council has is the establishment of international sanctions. Um, and so what this means is that the United Nations can take uh, uh, sorry the Security Council can pass a resolution that it will that would allow other uh, that would allow other countries to um, take actions towards, an offensive country. So the most common that you see of these are economic sanctions, which are typically like a ban on trade uh, um, with s possibly limiting that towards a ban on armaments instead of food or medicine to these countries. And it, it's intended as a punishment to countries that are either misbehaving in the global scheme or just unable or uh, like violating resolutions that were formerly passed. And so I think this is the most uh, punishable form of power that the Security Council has is to establish sanctions against a nation that is um, not acting to par within the global community. Um, the third one, and this mainly goes with the peacekeeping operations, is the authorization of military action. So yes, the Security Council has these peacekeeping forces, but they also do have the ability to authorize where they go and how what what they're meant to do at these parts uh, at these nations and the fourth and i think this is um 
the foundation for the entire for model United Nations and what we're going to be doing at either the Security Council or Historical Security Council at H1 India. Uh, the Security Council has the power to issue issue binding resolutions to all of its member states. Um, and so they can pass resolutions that it requires all its members to follow. Um, whether they're followed or not, we'll talk about that later, but um, this is the main foundation of how the Security Council works, is it passes resolutions that it requires all its members to follow and thus um, can create a better global community as a result of these um, more and more progressive resolutions. Um, in terms of its powers, we've talked a little bit about its criticisms, especially around the peacekeeping forces. Uh, there, there are more, more criticisms of how the Security Council powers work. For instance, um, many, many nations criticize the Security Council for having a lack of reliable military sources. And so this sort of, yeah, this does factor in into, for instance, yeah, the U.S. again having peacekeeping forces in a mission that's against the U.S. interests. That simply doesn't work, and so there's a criticism about uh, the varying degrees of power that nations like the United States might have over the Security Council. There's also criticisms about the permanent member system. Uh, some some people, um, some scholars believe that the five permanent members sort of create an exclusive club that addresses just the interests of their own nations. For instance, in 1991, the United Nations passed um, sent forces to settle a conflict in Kuwait, um, because, uh, possibly because that nation was very um, oil rich. Uh, for, uh, however, in 1994, uh, peacekeeping forces sort of uh, were very ineffective for Rwanda, which is relatively recess, uh, resource poor. Um, and so the effectiveness is very questioned about its uh, its powers within its own peacekeeping forces and its own motives. Is this an international community or is it a front for national interests by these p big five members? That's the main question that um, is criticized about the permanent member system. Um, and so, okay, Flint asks, if peacekeepers can be deployed only once a conflict is over, or if they can be de deployed at any time. Um, I believe I might have misspoke before. You're right. So peacekeeping forces can only be sent where armed conflict has either ceased or has been paused to allow for peace agreements um, and to discourage sort of hostility between them. Um, and so your UN peacekeeping forces cannot be sent in an active war or during active conflict at any time. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, great. Thanks for that, Couch. So back to uh, criticisms of its powers. There's also the criticisms of the effectiveness of resolutions. So we said this, that these resolutions were binding, but there are not really any explicit consequences for violating a resolution. Um, the United Nations can take sanction, uh, can take an action of sanctions against nations that try to violate these resolutions, uh, but there's no real encoded punishment for uh, violating a resolution or simply just not following a resolution. And so uh, there's definitely been points in history where uh, resolutions are simply just ignored um, and the United, United Nations Security Council have to find alternative means uh, to either punish the nations violated or try to enforce a different um, resolution that will be more amenable to all of the country's needs. Uh, Great, so I'm gonna take some, look at some questions before we move on to the format and the veto of the, of, um, of the Security Council. Okay, so miscellaneous asks, so only if a ceasefire is negotiated, then can peacekeepers be sent in? Yeah, this is exactly it. So peacekeeping, peacekeepers can only, uh, peacekeepers are meant to monitor and like check in with peace processes in post-conflict areas or to assist these combatants when they've paused war to try to implement peace agreements um, that both sides have, 
both sides of sight. Um, so they cannot be used during an active, um, they, they cannot be used actively um, during like active conflict. Okay, great. Um, so if there's no other questions, we'll move on. Okay, uh, Piano Guy asks, when the Security Council imposes sanctions, do they determine the type of sanctions imposed or should they just suggest it to the sanctions committee? Um, so when the Se Security Council can pass a resolution that impose uh, sanctions, um, but these are to be, so, Sorry, yeah. So they pass this to the sanctions committee, and the sanctions committee will oversee the implementation of these various sanctions. Um, and for the purposes of our model UN committee, we'd want resolutions or directives to determine what types of sanctions to be imposed. Uh, normally, I believe they should just go through the sanctions committee, um, uh, but it, for the purposes of our for our committees and for the Mali United Nations, we want to see um, actual lists of major things that um, that the Security Council wants to sanction. For instance, if it should just be arms, or if it should be uh, more drastic and be like food and medicine, uh, which is normally not taken. But if the committee decides that that's the right move, then that should be. Uh, determined within the committee itself, uh, not sent to the sanctions committee. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about the format of the Security Council. So the Security Council, um, it has 15 members. Uh, so five of those are uh, permanent members, uh, we'll talk about that, and then the other 10 are rotating members. These rotating members have 10-year terms, uh, sorry, two-year two, two terms, yeah, so they have two-year terms. If we go back to the five permanent members, once again, they are the um, currently the People's Republic of China, France, the Russian Federation, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Um, at the beginning of the United Nations and the Security Council's creation, the nations were a bit different. For instance, the Republic of China existed instead of the People's Republic of China, so that was modern day Taiwan, um, uh, or representatives from Taiwan. And instead of the Russian Federation, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the USSR existed. And that was disbanded in 1991 at the end of the Cold War, which is why it became the Russian Federation following shortly. Um, so these five nations all have veto power um, and they are permanent members, which means that they stay on the council indefinitely. Um, there have been further criticisms currently about um, uh, who exactly belongs on these permanent seats and there's definitely a call for an increase in seats for permanent members. Four nations, for instance, Brazil, Germany, India, and Japan, which play huge, uh, which play, which have huge roles in uh, international politics at this time, have all been suggested members by various countries within the Security Council. Um, but at least for now, there hasn't been a consensus to increase the number of of seats within the Security Council uh, itself for permanent members. Um, for the rota rotating members, uh, as I mentioned, they're elected by the General Assembly for two year terms at a time. Uh, so every year, five of them are replaced in it. And then the next year, the other five are replaced. And so every two years, we get a brand new set of 10 rotating members. Um, there's five different groups that we pull members from. And so three of the nations must be from Africa, uh, or from the Africa group, two of the nations must be from the Asia group, uh, another two from the Latin America 
a Latin American and Caribbean group, another two from the Western European group, and one from the Eastern European group. As it stands today, the Security Council is composed of the five permanent members, um, and the rotating members include Egypt, Senegal, Ethiopia, Japan, Kazakhstan, Uruguay, Bolivia, Sweden, Italy, and Ukraine. If we jump to the historical Security Council set uh, in 1986 for each in India, the countries represented there will be the five permanent members, Congo, Ghana, Madagascar, the United Arab Emirates, Thailand, Venezuela, Trinidad and Tobago, Australia, Denmark, and Bulgaria. Um, and so these 10 rotating members, um, uh, this is used so that every single nation sort of gets uh, some influence within the Security Council. Uh, but there are, uh, but other criticism about this might be that these nations just don't have a direct uh, involvement within these conflicts. And so, for instance, if Trinidad and Tobago is talking about the Syrian conflict, it might not be as appropriate for that nation to have uh, influence within the conflict or even uh, find the conflict necessary for their own nation to contribute to or to discuss about. Um, and so there have been criticisms about that system of rotating members um, and definitely proponents to try to get more relevant members um, onto the seat either by increasing permanent members or restructuring that rotating member system. Um, so the Security Council mainly meets in the UN conference building in New York City, but they also have different locations in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia, or in Panama City, or in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, so that's the main format of it. We have these 15 nations. In order to pass any resolutions, nine of those votes need to be yes. And so for a resolution to pass, it needs nine yeses and also none of the big five to veto um, the resolution. So for an instance, if we got 14 yeses and France decided to enact its veto power, the resolution would fail. So we need at least nine out of 15 and none of the uh, nations, none of the, sorry, uh, none of the big five nations to veto resolutions. Um, so I'll move on now to how committees are run. Uh, so we'll be running, both John Bowers and I will be running committee very similar to how the Security Council is actually run. Um, and so the votes necessary to pass any sort of resolution or any procedural motion is nine, uh, sorry, any votes necessary to pass a resolution will be nine out of 15. If this proves to be difficult to pass or if it proves to show that we simply just cannot get resolutions passed or discussion is just not happening, we can uh, liberally amend that to maybe just being a simple majority. Uh, so eight out of 15. In terms of procedural motions, it only takes a simple majority to pass procedural motions. So we only need eight out of 15 of those votes um, to pass anything procedurally. And so that's discussions. So moderate caucuses, unmoderate caucuses, or anything that's just not substantive. Um, if any members are not present, we can discuss uh, the changing of numbers accordingly. Um, so when it comes to voting, each country has three different things that they can say to vote. They can either vote for the resolution or the, uh, sorry, they can vote for the motion or the resolution or whatever. They can vote against it or they can abstain. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about abstentions simply because I think a lot of delegates are unfamiliar with abstentions or either use it incorrectly. Um, so an abstention is used uh, at least in the Security Council, an abstention should almost always, uh, should almost exclusively be used by only the big five powers. If any other nation is not, is using the, if any other nation is choosing to abstain, it's equivalent to saying, oh, I'm not listening, or, oh, I just wasn't listening, so I'm just going to abstain and not have an opinion on the resolution. If you're not one of the big five countries, 
an abstention is equivalent to voting against the resolution. It will not count as part of the nine votes necessary to pass a resolution. And so it's very important to be always listening to the resolutions and directives that are being discussed and to decide if you're not a big five power to decide whether you want to vote for or against that. For the big five powers, this changes up a little bit. I think the big five powers do have the power of abstention um, uh, and they should be able to use it more so than any other nation within the Security Council or the Historical Security Council. Um, abstentions will be, uh, uh, should be only used if a nation decides that it does not agree with a resolution but does not want to veto it. Um, and so, for instance, if China is looking at a resolution and decides that there's this one part of the resolution that it doesn't like, but it doesn't want to veto the entire thing, um, it can instead choose to abstain from voting on the resolution. And so it would still take uh, 9 out of 15, I'm sorry, it would still take 9 out of 15 votes to pass the resolution. Um, and the abstention would count as a no, but it would not count as a veto. So that's how the abstention power works. Once again, it should almost only be exclusively used by the big five powers. If you have any questions about that, I know that uh, can be a confusing topic. So please leave any questions that you might have about that. Okay, I don't think anyone has any major questions. So, uh, okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about how we decide to uh, run these committees. So uh, John and I both have slightly different plans for how we wanna run this, our, our own committees. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how um, John decides to write, run the Security Council. Um, so he's told me that he wants to run... Oh, sorry, okay. So Miscellaneous says, so a smaller nation can abstain, but it isn't looked favorable upon? I think, yeah, I think this is generally true. A smaller nation simply shouldn't abstain because there's nothing different between a smaller nation... Well, I don't like to classify a smaller nation, but a non-permanent nation. Um, voting to abstain is equivalent to that nation voting against the resolution uh, against the resolution or directive and so it's the abstention should really be only reserved for um, permanent members that decide not to veto but decide not to vote for the resolution okay um, so talk about how John decides to run this security council uh, he's told me that he wants to run this so both of our committees will be running continual crisis um, if you're not 100% familiar with what that means, uh, it just means that the co committee will be always within crisis, so you can always send crisis notes, and there will be constant crisis breaks uh, and crisis news reports coming out. Um, you can look more into, I know there's going to be a Crisis 101 video that's created. Uh, you can look more into that to, to figure out more about crisis. Um, John Bowers is having his committee be run, however, with uh, resolutions. And so crisis is used to steer resolution directed debate. These resolutions are supposed to be um, larger, more, um, I think, um, more theoretical actions on how the Security Council should adopt its policy towards, um, in, his, in his event, the Yemeni civil war. Um, so uh, on the other hand, my committee, the Historical Security Council, will be run with passing directives. So these directives are meant to be shorter, are meant to be much more um, much more actionable in a way. And so preambulatories are not preambulatory pre clauses are not necessary within writing a directive. Um, and we just want to and I just want to see like main actionable points to get whatever task that needs to be addressed passed as quickly as possible. Um, and so that's the sort of major difference between how we're going to run our committees for the Historical Security Council and the Security Council. Uh, John Bowers is looking more for resolution-focused debate and an overall, uh, at the end of the conference, to have a resolution passed. Um, 
that will overall determine the stance within uh, how the body how the body um, views the Yemeni civil war. Uh, in my committee, we won't have a resolution at the end of the committee, but instead we'll have directives throughout the committee that will address the minor points of this, uh, sorry, the, the major points that, that come up of the Salvadorian Civil War. Ajit asked, so the Security Council won't have any directives? Uh, so no, sorry, um, the Security Council will still have directives, but ultimately um, it will be building up towards a major resolution that it wants to pass that's going to give essentially the overall thesis of how the Security Council will view um, the Yemeni Civil War. Directives will definitely come up when you need shorter, more actionable things. I think um, most likely during big crisis breaks. Um, but the overall end goal is to take all those directives and merge them into this huge resolution um, that, uh, that will essentially take the entire uh, UN, uh, the Security Council's opinion regarding that conflict. Okay. Um, so, I think that wraps up most of most of this. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions about anything that I've said regarding history or powers or the format and the veto or how our committees are going to be run? Okay, so Ajit asks, so would imposing sanctions be a part of a directive or a resolution? So if you're in the Security Council, I would talk more to uh, John Bowers directly about this. Um, but at least in my committee, uh, yeah, in my committee, I would have imposing sanctions be part of a directive um, because it's more of an actionable thing. Um, for, I, I think, for instance, I don't want to speak for John Bowers, but for instance, within the Security Council, if you pass a directive that imposes sanctions on um, one country, that can be part of your overall resolution at the end, is to decide exactly the extent of the sanctions that are going to be taken um, and uh, uh, the time period and all the details of that, uh, sanction, uh, of that sanction policy. I think within directive, you're looking for more quick and actionable things in the resolution, you're looking for more comprehensive and more um, long-term actions that the Security Council should take. Okay, uh, Ms. Lane has asked, when voting on directives, can a nation abstain or is it just yes or no? So if we're, so if, so there's two different motions that countries can vote on, procedural motions and substantive motions. I believe you're asking about substantive motions, but just to quickly, briefly go over it, for procedural motions, all nations have to vote and it has to be yes or no. Um, this is to make sure that debate is always happening within the committee and we're not just at a standstill because nations aren't listening to what motions are being uh, proposed or whatever. Um, when it comes to voting on directives, that is a substantive measure, whether or not you agree that this substance should be passed or not. And so, like I said, it's um, at least uh, so the sorry. So as, as I was saying, the permanent five members have the power to abstain uh, and should use that whenever they determine so that they don't want to vote yes, but they don't want to veto the resolution. Um, other non-permanent members also do have the power to abstain, but it is rarely used by these countries because abstaining is essentially saying no to the resolution and it can um, sort of skew the perception of how a nation is voting. And so if you're a non-permanent nation, like 99% of the time, you should be either saying voting for the resolution or voting against the resolution. If you're a permanent member within the Security Council, then there's definitely room for an argument on whether or not you would want to abstain on something. Okay. Um, I'm looking for any other questions. So major, so this isn't someone's question, but a major topic that often comes up within the Security Council is bypassing the Security Council veto. Um, and so a lot of, I, I, I've seen several delegates try to bring up 
uh, this very like esoteric way to go around veto, and that's invoking what's called the UN Resolution 377, which allows it, which determines that if the Security Council can't maintain international peace, then the matter will be taken to the General Assembly to sort of revoke a country's veto. Um, this has really been used very, very limit, limitly. Um, so for example, in 1956, during the Suez Crisis, Britain and France were both, with, were both involved within that conflict and they were occupying parts of the canal. They vetoed the Security Council resolutions that were calling for the withdrawal and the United States used Resolution 377 um, to call for uh, a general, uh, an emergency general assembly session and they passed this resolution that required Britain and France to pull out shortly after. Um, this happens, um, this, this happens very rarely in real life. Um, for the purposes of the Security Council and the Historical Security Council, we look, uh, we really don't want this to happen within committee simply because there is no like general assembly that's happening at the time that, that we'd want to discuss these issues. So in terms of trying to fix veto powers, we suggest that delegates try to find other ways to either compromise with the veto power or to get nations with the veto power to all conclusively agree on a directive. Um, at least for the purposes of my committee, Resolution 377 just won't exist. We won't be able to invoke that. Um, you can talk more to John Bowers if you're part of the Security Council and want to learn more about that. Um, but I think for the majority of the part, we want delegates to find clever solutions around veto power. Of course, if veto becomes a problem, we can discuss some of the more ramifications of that, uh, but that's an important issue that I want to bring up. Um, Unknown asks, what are all of the procedural motions? So uh, procedural motions are just motions to uh, that are not substantive. That's motions to say like, okay, we're gonna call for a moderate caucus or we're gonna call for an unmoderate caucus. Um, or things that just don't have substance, things are, that are not like voting on a resolution or voting on a directive. Um, I do believe there's going to be a parliamentary procedure seminar that's talking about this. I don't know if that's been talked about already, but um, you should definitely go check out that webinar if you're interested more about um, procedural motions or the procedures of uh, Model UN or Security Council in particular. Ajit asks, are there presidential statements? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. If you could clarify that in the chat, that'd be helpful. Oh, and I remember, um, was it Piano Guy talked about directives and communiques. Um, so we talked about directives a little bit. Communiques are sort of public messages that can be passed by the committee that are either sent to another nation or sent to the global community. Um, so communique, um, in case you didn't know, is French for sort of like a press release in a way. And so the Security Council can pass communiques that would allow uh, nations to know about uh, various events that are happening. Um, Normally, I would stray away from having too many communiques. Um, I know a lot of delegates can see them as a sort of a supplement of taking actual act of taking actual action. And we, I, I, at least I personally would rather see more directives being passed than communiques, which are sort of just uh, giving a press release or announcing something that's happened in uh, the global community instead of taking um, a list of actions that it wants to do. Oh, so Ajit, I think, so Ajit uh, clarified, we're members state the council's progress to the press. I think you can, we're talking about this with communiques. I would say you can do this with communiques. Um, I would recommend to do it limitedly um, because communiques are sort of take away from the time that we can talk about actual actions. Um, if you do want to leak something to the press or do you want to do something involving the press, I would definitely recommend uh, that you look more through that through crisis. Um, so for instance, if you find another nation has been 
involved in a conflict where no nation should have stepped ground. You can leak this information to a different press organization um, and action can be taken accordingly through crisis. Okay. Um, well, so I have to leave soon, uh, but thank you all for the web for being here at this webinar. If you're watching this recorded version, thank you for making it all the way to this to the end of this video. Um, if you guys have any last minute questions, I can start wrapping. Uh, I can start discussing them while I wrap up. Um, but. I have several, several different reminders that I want to give you guys. Uh, so I want to remind all delegates to thoroughly read the background guide. If you need the password, email info at h1india.org. Um, but we want all delegates to read the background guide thoroughly because we want these delegates to pay attention. Um, we want these delegates to pay attention to all of the aspects of, uh, all of, the aspects of that committee itself. Um, okay, Ajit asks, how do notes work? This, of course, is also going to depend on the committee. I'm not 100% sure if you're talking about crisis notes or just notes within the room. Um, you can, uh, so the Security Council and the Historical Security Council is run double delegate. So you, norm, so this means you have two delegates per nation in the country. So often if you're trying to discuss something else with another nation, please do that outside of the, outside of the room so that it doesn't disturb any speakers within the room because we want everyone to be listening to the speeches that are given um, within the committee room. But your other delegates can be used um, to discuss and create resolutions outside of the room or to write crisis notes. So notes, uh, so Aji, yeah, Aji further asked, can we send notes to our co-delegate outside committee? Um, so your co-delegate, uh, you can send notes to them, but it might just be easier to talk to them directly. Um, but you can send notes to other delegates using any notepads or post-it notes that you might have. For crisis notes, that will be different based on the room, but those will likely be passed up to the front of the room will to be processed. Um, yeah. Okay. Miscellaneous asks, directives just consist of operative clauses, right? Yeah, that's the difference between, major difference between directives and resolutions. Resolutions include preambulatory clauses and operative clauses. Directives just include operative clauses. Um, okay, uh, so second announcement, I encourage you guys all to email your directives with any substantive questions um, about the committee or about anything regarding your position paper or anything. Um, and if you have any administrative or logistics questions, to email info at h1india.org. Um, and finally, a last reminder that position papers are going to be due 10 days from now on Monday, July 24th, and we'd want them to up be uploaded to Monbase. The information about position papers is in the guide to delegate prep, um, but if you have any questions about that, please directly email your committee director and they can definitely help you out uh, with your position paper um, if you have any questions or are struggling with it at all. Um, Okay, I'm gonna hang tight for another like, half minute to see if anyone else has any last minute questions. So if you do, type them quickly. Okay, um, I'm going to sign off. Thank you very much for being here. If you watch this live or watching this to the end, if it's recorded, I really had the pleasure talking to you about the Security Council and its more finer points. If you do have any further questions, uh, especially if you're watching this recorded, you can once again, once again email me at hsc at h1india.org. If you have any directly related Security Council questions instead of I like the Security Council Committee run by John Bowers. I would recommend you email him, but I should be available to answer any questions that you might have about the Security Council or how either committee is generally run. Okay, great. Thank you all um, and have a